introduce uh, Dr. Roy Richmond, who's been with us since Friday night. And uh, we're going to do something a little different so you don't get sh uh, shook up, so I just let you know what's going to happen. He's going to try to stay within the realm of 45 minutes. And uh, we don't know if he can do it. Needless to say, a very excited man. I, ta I talked to my wife last night, and she sends your greetings. Her name's Donna. And I put a post on her Facebook how much I missed her. And I said, you've got to come with me next time, because if you don't, I don't get to come. I've told several people I can't come back without my wife. So uh, I miss my wife. She's my better half, but we're really not a half or one. And we know, we know that in the truest sense of the word. And I was watching the news this morning, and somebody said that, I don't know what they were talking about, but I just heard him saying six is powerful, and I heard one is more powerful than two. And, you know, we've been talking about not two, but one. And really, when you know that you're one, the Lord our God is one, and you know you're one, that's more powerful than two. And what did Jesus pray in his high priestly prayer? He said, Father, I pray that you make them one as you and I are one. And guess what? Jesus got his prayer answered. Amen. So we are one. We just don't know it. And I think we know it, right? Amen. We know who we are. And so it's been a very exciting week. It's uh it seems like to me it's been a whole week. I've pretty much lost track of time. Uh, my wife listened to one of my sermons. She says, oh, my God, Roy, you went an hour and 45 minutes. <laughs> and I had no clue. I, you know, I, nobody got mad, I don't think. But I, I always think when we come to church, one of the greatest things we can do for our pastors and our praise and worship group, and I don't know where Tammy went, but I thank her for, Patty, sorry, went, is she in here? Not right now. Oh, right there you are, I'm sorry. How can I miss you? <laughs> but I, I thank you for really ministering to us yesterday and today, and of course your team up here. But uh, I just, I say to you, if you don't know it, and I'm sure you do, but you are a psalmstress, and you said yesterday that you're praying that the Lord would give you new songs, and I just speak to you that that's happening, and it's going to happen more, and you're going to start hearing songs in your sleep, and you're going to wake up and write them. You need to start keeping a notepad by your bed because sometimes the Lord speaks to us and we forget, you know. But you're going to start hearing tunes in your head and go with it. When you're driving down the street, you're going to start hearing tunes in your head and you're going to hear words from your pastor and say, that will make a great song. And I just speak that over you and just receive it. Because I, I could sit under your singing all the time. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. you, you make me rest when I listen yeah, to you. Yeah. Is that all right to say that? The moment I heard you up there, I said, wow, yeah, yeah. that's a woman that has a ministry of, of rest yes. and peace in her. So yes. don't worry, let him do it, though. Yeah. I'm in a new chapter in my life, and the first thing I heard, I don't know what that chapter is going to be, and I'm not going to write it. Mm -hmm. I'm going to let the Lord write it. There so I bless you. My Pastor Ryan, I bless you for allowing us to use your beautiful facilities here. I think it's awesome. Your congregation's wonderful, and of course, Charlene and everybody that's had us. I, I'm thank you, thank you so much. This is this is what I will live for: is to go out and preach and minister the gospel of Jesus Christ to people who are hungry. Yes. And uh, you know, sometimes I get a little scared when I go places because I know I'm kind of bold, and I I say things, and it, I'm kind of like a get real with Phil type guy. You know that Dr. Phil. But I, I the Lord is. I'm so tired of playing games. Right. Yes. I'm so tired of. I have to be careful what you say to people because you're afraid you're going to offend them. The Apostle Paul wasn't that way. Jesus wasn't that way. But we respect people and we honor people. Yeah. But I met a lady out in the parking lot when I was taking a picture of the flyer. Where are you at? Right there. And uh, she was so sweet, but I just asked her. I said, are you ready to hear things that you may not know? And she said, I am so ready. <laughs> you know, and I believe people really are there. Some people may not know they're there. But I, I believe people are ready because the very spirit in the bride, you, we used to say the, the spirit and the bride, but really the spirit in the bride is saying come. Uh, my uh, song leader for many years wrote a, a song called Come to My Table. And that's what the spirit in the bride is saying, come to my table, come and feed. You know, so I'm going to set my watch right up here so I can kind of watch it. It's five minutes till, so I need to quit about a quarter to 12. Is that all right? I'll do my best to do that, and then uh, I encourage you, if you can, say, because Ka uh, Dr. K is going to come up and wrap all this up. She's going to sew all the things together and correct me if she needs to, and I would have no problem with that, but she's not. 
But uh, you're, you're going to really like it if you haven't heard Dr. K. She's fabulous. She's, she is anointed minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what I want to do today, uh, and for those of you who are, are new to hearing me and Kay, we've been dealing with a lot of questions uh, since Friday. There, the church has a lot of questions. Would you agree with me? Yeah. We've, we've just, we've many times we said, if this is so, why? And if this is so, why? And is this real? You know, a, a fellowship in South Carolina sent me 32 questions. They didn't want me to teach. Dr. K and I were coming. We were going to teach out of living out of our spiritual resources. And, and the pastor said, no, you let Kay do that. Uh, we need you to answer some questions. And Kay answers questions when she ministers all the time, if you listen. But they sent me 32 questions. And they were questions that I've heard people ask all my life. And I've asked all my life. You know, what about angels? What about heaven? What about hell? What about devils? What about demons? All those questions. And the conversation has been about those way too long because most people either won't answer them or are not able to answer them. And so uh, I just, when I read them, I said, Father, why do people, why do people keep asking this? Because I didn't want to do that. I wanted to teach, you know, more higher understanding. But this is a higher understanding when you get your questions answered. But the Lord told me when somebody will answer them. So I said, okay, I will, with your help. So I spent several weeks, and the Lord just opened some things up to me, and he had made me a scribe already to able to look in the Word and see what doesn't fit there and what does, and translate it, explain it, and make it palatable like uh, uh, Ezra, where you can read the Word and make the sense of it. When you read the Word and make the sense of it, and I'm not talking about the sense realm, and make it understandable, that causes people to stand up as one man, not two, but one. The Bible says, greater is he that's within you than he that's within the world. Well, what do most people think that he that in the world is? A devil, right? Yeah. But really it's talking about greater is the God within you, the mind of Christ within you, than the part of you, the he of you that's the sin, in the sense realm. Mm -hmm. That's really what it's talking about. Mm -hmm. Greater is the real he in you than that false he in you that's from your brain with the wrong information because your sense realm is in the world. It's in the cosmos system, the world like I explained yesterday. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it, you're very weak if all your awareness is in the world. Yeah. You're very weak and you're powerless if it's, all, if it's all about the political system, the medical system, the financial system, the uh, religious system, and the social system. You're weak. But if you're, if you're leaning to the spirit, man, that makes you powerful. That brings wisdom and knowledge to you. And, and you can function and you can listen to the voice of the Spirit all the time. Uh, my first associate pastor, she gave me this gold tree. And I love this gold tree, it, you know, because my ministry is called Tree of Life. Well, this morning when I was packing, getting ready to leave, I remember, well, where's my gold tree? And I thought it was on my suit. Couldn't find it. You know, I didn't go look at my suitcase. I just thought, well, it must be in my suitcase somewhere. I immediately heard, you threw it away in the trash can. Now, what was that? That was my mind of Christ. Yeah. I just walked right over there, yeah. moves and trash, yeah. there it was. Yeah. I know that's a simple thing, yeah. but we can hear the voice of the Spirit all the time. It can lead us and it can guide us and mainly into the things of, of Jesus, but also it gives us direction in the earth today. So it's important for us to do that and understand that. Uh, I was taught by Brother Garner many years ago, and I still stick with it. Everything that I teach, everything that Kay teaches is based on the redemptive work of Jesus Christ. Everything must go back to that. I've been teaching this off and on for many years. Brother Garner called it Six Steps to the Throne. I call it the Revelation of Redemption. And we've been, we at my fellowship have been dealing with a shorter version of it, and I'm calling it the never-ending story. And I encourage you uh, not just to hear me, but to listen to it on my webpage. I've got 10 sessions on it right now, and it's treeoflifeok.com. It's real easy, treeoflife and at okforoklahoma.com. And listen to it because it's a detailed teaching on crucified, died, buried, quick, and raised, and seated, which most people have never heard of that ever. But it's all uh, in, in, uh, twined into uh, Paul's writings. And so the crucified, died, buried is the what we call the death side of the cross. It's the side of the cross, or, or uh, the Old Testament calls it the operation of God. But it's the side of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ that did away with the estate are the condition of the first man, Adam, that no longer exists. Yeah. The only reason we talk about it 
The only reason the Apostle Paul talked about him was to explain to the people back then what happened to the condition of man before the cross. And so when they translated all of it, they translated you died, we died, and all that. You know, we still say that sometimes. But it's really, it's talking about the people that were before the cross. Those people were no longer men, as Kay said, they became human. And you get the word human from when you hewn a tree down. And we are trees of righteousness. And Adam hewed them down by cutting himself off from his life source, which was God. Right? right. Which was Father God. And from then on, I explained that he produced, he had a divine nature activity. He had the very nature of God in him. But because he cut himself off from God, his father, his creator, then that nature became degenerate. And then from that on, he lived out a degenerate nature activity. And it seems like we live out of that today. And in a sense, we do because the perception is that we're still just humans. We're still just sinners saved by grace. And if you believe that, and you've been taught that most of your life, then you literally allow all this stuff to function in you. And Sister Kay's told you that that's illegal because Jesus bore every bit of it. And if you had any clue what he went through, I'm not going to go through it all today, but if you had any clue what he went through, and forget the cross. Lots of people died on the cross and never let out a sound. But what he went through when he opened himself up and he emptied himself out of the Godhead and he received in himself every, every drop of that tainted blood that was in man, yep. because that's where sickness and disease flows to the body. Yep. Every drop of that, that degenerate nature activity, he drew that in himself mm -hmm. in a moment of time. Mm -hmm. That had to be unbelievably horrible. We have cried when we listened to what our soldiers went through in Vietnam. And, and when Japan abused our soldiers, something horrible. We cry when we hear about how people have been abused in homes and been kidnapped. But, but think what Jesus went through. It was horrible. And then yet, here we are, and he said, it's finished. It's done. What did you say to me a minute ago? How to sign, sealed, and delivered? It's all done, and he did it, and yet we're still, here we are, in the realm of time over 2,000, 14, 15 years from what he did it already, and we're still, we, in our estimation, we're still sick in our estimation, and we're still dying needlessly, and we're not. We're whole. We're redeemed. Our body's completely redeemed, and like Kay said, we need the realization of it, that it's whatever's, whatever's bothering you, it's gone. It's gone. You know, I, Brother, Brother Garner said this years ago, but he said, we're about like the people after the children of Israel when they crossed the Red Sea. And they stood on the other side of the Red Sea and they watched Pharaoh and his armies been destroyed. Right? They watched it. They watched the water come down on them, bury them, crush them, all that. And then about two days later, somebody comes to Moses and said, man, Moses, I am having a hard time. He said, what do you mean? He said, Pharaoh has been bothering me constantly. He makes me eat ice cream. And then an hour later, he made me eat a banana split. And then I, the next day, he made me eat a shake. That's all I talk about. I don't talk about other stuff. And Moses would say, now, wait a minute. Did you not see Pharaoh's and his armies destroyed? And you know what a lot of people would have to say today? No, I haven't seen that. So we talk about some kind of entity that bothers us all the time. And one of the biggest ones is my old man. Right? And then there's another one we talk about. And God would say to you, and I say to you today, have you not seen, have you not heard, have you not known that Jesus destroyed that, made it completely void, it does not exist, and most of the world would have to say, no, because it hasn't been explained to me. So that's what we do with this death side of the cross. And if you'll read uh, what our, the book in it, there's a lot of pages to crucify, died, and quicken, crucify, died, and buried. Some of them have 20, 25 pages. There's all kinds of scriptures about crucified, died, and buried. But then you come along to the made alive side and the, the 
the quick and raise aside, uh, quick and raise the seated, and there's not very many verses to that. You know why? Because God knows we need lots of pictures to help us understand. We fight to hang on to that, what we think to be an old man. We fight for the right to be a sinner saved by grace. I've, had, I've told people that your righteousness, no, I'm not. I've had people get mad at me, literally mad at me for saying, you don't have an enemy. Your only enemy is what you think. Yeah, and you're right. And I mean, that will crucify you for saying that. That's our <laughs> because that's what they've been taught all their life. But see, yeah. Father God brings forth revelation. He brings forth manifestation by proving that that non-existent character is dead and gone and it doesn't exist anymore. What does revelation mean? It means taking off the cover. I always thought it was the Jews that were blind. I've been waiting for the Jews for most of my life to, for the cover. To, but it was everybody that was blind. Everybody was blind to what the Lord had done. And so, Father knows that the not natural process is if you do not understand what you believe is your old man is gone, then you spend your entire life trying to deal with it. And that's where I've been most of my life. My first 10 years of my life was a Pentecostal holiness. Uh, the next 38 years was a non-denominational church. Yeah. And I tell you, I, I spent all my life fighting what I thought was holding me back. Mm -hmm. And fighting and fighting and fighting. And that can't bring you to rest when you're fighting. Mm -hmm. When you're trying to battle something. and Spiritual warfare. and Beat something up and rebuke something. There's no rest in that, is there? Yeah. No. And you go home and you know what? I, I mentioned it the other day. But there's, there's, a, there's a funny uh, uh, demigod in the Old Testament that the Philistines worshipped. It was called Dagon. And I pointed out that I call it that Dagon God. <laughs> but they put the ark in the presence of it. The Philistines did, and it fell. And, you know, but they kept lifting it back up. And finally, it just wasted away and went to nothing. The very life of And see, what's interesting, the third day, the first day it fell, they lifted it back up. The second day they it fell, its arms and its legs was gone. The third day, what's the third day all about? Thank God for the third day. That was a resurrection, right? The third day, it 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 actually was translated only a stump of it was left. Only the stump of it was left. But if you look at the translation of it, it said it wasted away to nothing. In the presence of the ark, it wasted away. Nothing. And that's a fabulous picture of what Jesus did. Everything that you've been worried about, everything that you've been fighting about, Jesus wasted away to nothing. So we're believing a lie, and we've been uh, the children of a great lie. Yeah. And I think I need to read Psalm 714 again. Don't you think so, yeah. guys? In the King James, and I've got to explain to those of you that haven't heard me before, the Lord helps me translate Scripture. It's a gifting that God's given me, and I translate it because I understand the finished work of the cross. And so when I can teach you today, I'm going to be reading you some versions that won't match up with your King James, so don't freak out. It's, it's a, what I call the most holy place version. It's from a place of rest and understanding. But it says in the King James, Behold, he travaileth with iniquity. It's talking about Adam, the first man Adam, and hath conceived mischief and brought forth falsehoods. So this message Bible your pastor has been sharing with you, if you'll look it up in there, it says, and it was funny, the pastor didn't believe me yesterday, and he had to look it up. I, did. <laughs> I know you did, I'm playing with But when he saw it with his eyes, it's just like, oh my gosh. But it says, look at that guy. He had sex with sin, which sin means missing the mark. He had union with missing the mark. He's pregnant with evil. Oh, look, he's having the baby, a lie baby. What verse is this? That's Psalm 714 in the message translation. He gave birth. He, he was supposed to reproduce in God's image, and he yeah. gave uh, re reproduced in a mistaken identity and yeah. an image that had a degenerate nature activity, and it was a lie, baby, because it is a lie. It's yeah. not the real. Yeah. It's not what God intended for us. And he has a purpose for us today, and he has a purpose for us right now. Because he doesn't want us to live a non-existent life, always fighting, always fighting, always fighting. It's like shadow boxing. 
Many preach from the pulpit that we need to get rid of this stinking lifestyle, and they call it flesh. So there again, we're always fighting. I'm trying to quit drinking. I'm trying to quit cussing. I'm trying to quit watching bad movies. I'm trying to quit smoking. The list goes on and on and on. All right? Right. Amen. And then here's 10 things you can do to become a good Christian. All right? Pray good. But then you, 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 you had to pray like I pray. You know? And of course, you've got to give 10% of all your money. All right? You got these all these lists that you've got to do, and guess what? You can't do it. And my my pastor friend Butch Hodge preached a series, and it's on my webpage, and it is called uh, "It's Written in Red." And if it's written in red, you got to do it, right? I mean, it's Jesus is talking, and you got to do it. And most of it was him adding to their law because they thought, it, "Oh, I've done this." The, the rich young ruler came along and said. Uh, Jesus, I have obeyed all the law. What must I do? And Jesus looked at him and said, oh, you think it's by the law. He didn't say that. That's what he was thinking. So you think you've done this by the law, so I'll give you another one. Go sell all you have and give it to the poor. Well, see, Jesus is a mind reader <laughs> or brain reader. He, he knows because he's one. He knew what the guy was thinking, so he knew he couldn't do it. And so the guy bowed his head and walked away, right? And then the, the Pharisees came to Jesus and said, it's been written, oh, if a man committeth adultery, he will not enter the kingdom of God, which is not heaven. It's righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. Because today, if you committed adultery, the church sure is not going to let you know you're righteous, right? And you'll have no peace and joy. And so they, he said, oh, so you think because you haven't committed adultery, you, you've obeyed all the law, right? Well, I'll tell you another one. If you've even looked at a woman, and thought how gorgeous she is and how I like to be with her. Men, how many of you done that? Rachel? <laughs> you liars? <laughs> My baby. You know, I picked on the man last night and only one raised his hand. <laughs> They're scared to death. So, so he added to it. If you, if you thought about it, you, you've done it already. Everything that Jesus said in the red like that all he was doing was say, you want the law? I'll give you some more law. And what have we done with those things? We took them and we preached to the people yeah. and we used them. And we've, we've added to these list of things that we told you not to do. And what's happening? People are failing. We can't do that. We never could do it. The children of Israel, when God gave them the Ten Commandments, you know what they should have said? God, we can't do that. Yeah. And he said, he would have said, exactly. So let me be your father. Let me walk you through this journey. Let me take you to the promised land. But guess what? The promised land wasn't that land. The promised land is a man. Yeah. Let me take you to the place where you're the man I created you to be. Or you said, well, I thought it was Jesus. Yes, it was Jesus. But guess what? We're just as Jesus. Not two, but one. My, one of my biggest problems all my life was I thought God was God and I'm Roy. Or Jesus was Jesus, and I'm Roy, and it was two. It was all there was always a separation. He was up there, and if I could get him to come to me, and all that. But man, the greatest revelation I ever received is the Lord our God is one, and I'm one. And we talk about how it said that we shall live in a sight, which means a plural of a noun. So we say we're the plural of God. But it's really more than that. You know, you can have twins, identical twins, but there still is a difference. They have different thought processes, different things. They're very close, though, but there's still, there's a difference. But it's more than a twin. I'm as God. You're as God in a body. And like I said, the difference between what the first man Adam did and what our elder brother did and what we should do is consider it not robbery to say, I'm as God, but don't exalt myself above people. Humble myself and become a servant to all people. So... The mess, this is the message. You cannot do it. If you could, why did we need Jesus to come? And see, that's why people think that Jesus needs to come back and defeat an enemy and make all things right because they don't know that Jesus did it all. Right? right. If you believe in a rapture, that's okay. You will have one someday, I promise you. But you have to ask yourself, why do you want one? Try to get out of here. Exactly right. Escapist yeah. mentality. I have had many times in my life that I was about bankrupt. 
I had many times in my life where I lost jobs and I was miserable, and my only prayer was, God, please hurry up with the rapture. <laughs> I'm, I'm ready to go. Yeah. What was it in uh, New Year's Eve 2000? We were rapture compliant, wasn't we? We, we? we repented of every mark missing we'd ever done. We made sure we paid our tithe and made up for it. And then we went and asked the pastor to forgive us for treating bad. <laughs> and we were rapture compliant. You know, in 1988, I was managing Ball Mills Furniture in Oklahoma City. And a bunch of people in there had never gone to church. Never, you know. And this guy wrote 88 reasons why Jesus is coming back in 1988. It was spread all over the world, all over the place. Did any of you ever hear of it? Yeah. Well, every, almost, I, I would say probably at least 15 or 20 of them the week before New Year's Eve, they knew I was a pastor and they came and they asked me to pray over them and they wanted to get saved. <laughs> so, uh, January 1st, 2000, they all went right back. <laughs> I mean, it's just, we got to think how silly it is what we put three people through. Right. Really? We do. Let's look at Romans 6, 5, and it's going to be in my translation, so you probably just want to listen to it. If, and we have. Anytime Paul said, if you're in Christ, he was saying, because you are. Really? That, that, I mean, you really know that. Because if you don't, most people think, well, I'm in Christ, but they're not in Christ. Pastor Garner, before he died, he finally uh, woke up to something. But before he taught that there was two men in the earth. He didn't, he hadn't yet well, awakened to that Adam had been done away with. Right, Yvonne? Right. And so he would teach there's two men on earth. There's Adam, and then if you're born again, if you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior, said the sinner's prayer, then you're in Christ. But just before he got sick, he awakened to the fact there's only one man on the earth. And so when Paul's writing this, it's just like, uh, I gave uh, Mike some money, so I say, Mike, if you have that money, I want you to go enjoy it. That's kind of how Paul said it. But actually, he's saying, because you have that money, go enjoy it. Right? You got that clear? So if and we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, what would follow? And, of course, the King James says we shall. They put there, we shall. But literally it says we exist in resurrection life. Every place that it says shall, you look it up, it says I exist. So start seeing that when you read your Bible and it says you shall be this or you shall be that, meaning in the future, it says I exist that right now. As Case said with the communion elements, you exist whole today. Quit asking God to heal you and realize that he is your help and start drawing from that. Job said what? My help is from within. It's not from without, it's from within. So you exist in resurrection life right now. Stop in the name of Jesus. I'm talking to my clock. <laughs> Planted together is soon. It's spelled sun, but it's soon. And it's a primary preposition that denotes union as one. So we are one with Father. And I like the word uh, resurrect resurrection. It's Anastasia, which would be a good name for somebody. It means to stand up again. So what, what did Adam do? They weren't standing up. They were crouched down. They were living a life of non-existence. That's what the word perish means. And literally, you're just you're not living as Christ the new man, so you're living in non-existence. So resurrection life means stand up again. It means raise to life again. And that's what God did with this new creation man. He, he revivified, pushed forward his life, and raised man back up to stand upright to be who they be and to live out of the heavenly realm. So he did not say that you have to live the resurrection life. He said you have the resurrection life. There's a lot of people saying today that we need to, all right, you know, so this is all true, so I'm going to walk this out. You ever heard that? Mm -hmm. It's time that we start walking this out. No, no, you don't walk it out. You live out of it. You were never told that you had to walk it out because to walk it out means I've got to quit this, I've got to quit that, I've got to stop doing that. No, you just live out of it and living out of it does away with everything else. It frees you from it. You know, sister, if I could, if I had a vial of God's blood right here, <laughs> and I went in and I just put it into your blood, what would you think would happen? Pretty cool, probably. The very life of God, it was just 
You would expect it just to flow through your body and change everything. And the fact is, you already have it. You, you can't get any more of God. There's no need in saying, oh, Father, I need you, I need you. We should sing, I need thee, oh, I need thee. And we would cry, and, you know, and I don't mock those songs. They're, they're precious to me. They brought me some. But you don't have to say that anymore. You don't need God. You don't need more of God. You don't need to be drawn closer to God. How could you be any closer than one? You can't be. And this is not me just saying it. It's in the Word. So the problem is, is the activity in a sense has been cut off because we haven't known who we are. We have not known who we are. So here's the principle. If you're planted in the likeness of his death, then the natural consequences is that you have resurrection life. And a major problem is we don't understand God's one-man plan. One-man plan. In the earth today, there's only one man. We are many members, just like I'm one man, but I have a left leg, a right leg, a left arm, a right arm. I have a head. I've got organs. But I'm, I'm one. And I like to say this. I can't live without much of it, especially my vital organs, which is what? My lung, my heart, my kidneys, my liver. Those are vital organs. I can't live without them. Guess what? You are vital to me. You are vital to the body of Christ. You are vital to this earth. This, the people of this earth will never live life and life more abundantly until there is a first fruits company that will wake up and show them the way. You've got to know that you're vital. So once you find out that you're vital to the earth, instead of sitting around and say, God, when are you going to do something? Or when are we going to get the right president? That's the big thing going on right now, right? How many of you love President Obama? It's all right. How many of you love? Him? How many of you love another president? See, we, we all, we all, we all want our man. It's not a man that's going to come and function in the five sense realm. It's the body of Christ this earth is crying for. Yeah. This whole planet, the earthquakes, everything out of order is groaning for the manifestation. The, and it's here, but we don't know it. So nobody's seeing it. And so we must wake up. See, what we want, the church world, is we want Jesus back. Right? We, we want Jesus. Oh, if I could just see Jesus. If he could, but see, Jesus was God in a man. And who are you? Would you be bold enough to say who you are? You are God in a man. You're not Jesus, because Jesus saw destruction. You're the, the out, what came out of that grave. Jesus identified, and he willingly became 100% human. He was the federal head of the human race. Adam was the federal head of the human race. He was the first man, Adam. And he whatever he did affected everyone after him, right? And one, all missed the mark. And another one, all were made righteous from the beginning to the end. So today, you can say that you don't have to go around telling people because they may put you in a mental institution, <laughs> but you gotta know. And you know, like what Kay said in, in the book, is you don't have to say always what you know, but you can minister out of what you know. Because not all, everybody can take what you know. But you can definitely minister out of that awareness of what you know, you know? And it's, you know, don't you? <laughs> So we can't see ourselves as separate, separate. And we have a whole bunch of people preaching resurrection life, but living a life far below it because there's no explanation to help people with it. Now we have Romans 6.6. 6, knowing this, here's the question, do you know it? Knowing this, that the old, worn out, degenerate nature activity of all who, who were of the first man Adam is crucified. So you've got to know that. You've got to know that it died and it was buried. Yep. does not exist anymore. Sure 25, 30 years ago, my dad's body ceased to be able to hold him. Mm -hmm. And we took him to Rest Haven Cemetery in Oklahoma City. He died and he was buried. He's gone. That body's gone. He's still alive in spirit, but he's gone. But see, Adam is not still alive. Adam was crucified, died, buried. And the Bible says he, he was melted away, made void, brought to naught, 
doesn't exist anymore. Family, there is going to come a time, and I'm saying this for the new people here today, there's going to come a time that we don't even mention it anymore. Nope. And in our fellowships, once we know these things, then we should be able to go on. And that's what Kay and I are trying to do. We need to go on with greater awareness of who we are and be equipped to do the work of the ministry. So you need a five-fold ministry. What we're doing here is we're equipping you with the truth so you can do the work of the ministry. Yeah. And that's not so much cleaning the church. We need people to do that. That's not so much been Sunday school teachers. But the work of the ministry is to go you into all your world and make disciples of all men. Go, go help make people free. Jesus set them free. Go help make people free. So Romans 6.6, 6, knowing this, that the old worn out, degenerate nature activity of all who were of the first man, Adam, is crucified. That, and we can put, and it's, it died and it's buried. That the whole slavery to live in as a human, man hewn down from the heavenly to the dust realm, being rendered entirely idle, abolished, done away, become no effect, loosened, brought to naught, put away, vanished away, and made void. Does that make sense? I mean, is that enough there? It doesn't exist. You don't have an old man. You are nothing but a new creation being full of the life of God. From head to toe and every cell of your being, in, in the places that hurt, in places that doctor says there's, a, there's disease in it, that may be a fact, but it's not the truth. And I choose to believe the truth. The truth of God. Amen. That henceforth, we should, I like the word should, you should no longer be in bondage to false beliefs, which produce the opposite of life, light, and glory. They promise us one thing, but we got another. Yep. If you just come to church and get saved, your life is going to be so good. <laughs> And you're going to have so much peace and so much joy. And I don't deny the times that people have come and accepted the gift of salvation and just had a glorious experience. My wife did, at 16 years old, had a glorious experience. But I'm telling you, it was been a pretty tough life until we woke up to something. Because we still lived in the sense realm. I had no clue, she had no clue that we had the mind of Christ. Even though the Bible said it. Well, it says we have it, but I don't have it, so there must be something wrong with me. Romans 6, 13, God forbid that you present yourself with a false character, being a weapon against yourself, living below your true nature and character, but exhibit yourself to God living from out of the state of those who live as void of his life, out of that. And your whole being living in and of your true character one with Father God. You know what your father doesn't want? He doesn't want you crawling to him and say, Father, I'm such a horrible person. Please forgive me. You know what he would say? Have you not heard? Have you not known? Do you not know that I forgave you? Do you not know that really I forgave you for before the very foundation of this earth? Do you not know that he forgave you before you ever came out of your mother's womb? And I've had people get mad at me when I say, you do not have to ask God to forgive you for anything. You say, Father, I thank you that you already forgave me of that. And I thank you that what I did that's bothered me does not represent who I really am. And I thank you that your conviction 